You muted him. Ah, take two. <laughs> All right, Peter, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's good to see everyone virtually. I wish it was under different circumstances and that we were in person together. Uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, good to keep some of the excitement uh, around this beta forum going by telling you about some of the things that have been happening at the intersection of machine learning and theoretical physics. Uh, so today I have two 45 minute chunks to give you and there will be two topics per chunk. And half of the topics are related to things I've done, which maybe I should only do one of those, but frankly, it's, it's much easier to tell people about things you've worked on yourself. Uh, but the other two are, uh, uh, topics that are uh, I find particularly interesting in, in uh, theoretical physics and machine learning that have come out in the last few years. And of course, there's many works I couldn't talk about today, but uh, I'll do my best. So, all right. So, <clears throat> uh, first of all, if you're new to thinking about these sorts of things, there's more and more ways to connect at the interface of theoretical physics and machine learning. So, as was already mentioned, uh, I am uh, proud to be a member uh, of the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. This is one of five new NSF institutes at the interface, uh, 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 sorry, on AI. And this is the only one at the interface with physics. This is joint between MIT, Harvard, Northeastern, and Tufts. And we ask all sorts of questions there, like can math and physics help discoveries in machine learning? And can machine learning help discoveries in math and physics? There's also an online seminar series that I'm a part of, uh, Physics Meets ML. Uh, and uh, we've been organizing this for about a year now, and you can find the videos and slides online. It's a continuation of a meeting that we had in 2019 at Microsoft Research uh, and uh, involves some, some friends from academia and industry that are helping to organize it as well. And finally, um, String Data is coming up uh, in uh, 2021 in December at the University of Witwatersrand uh, in South Africa. The format is to be determined, but the uh, Wits Rural Facility has been reserved near Kruger National Park. So if this is something you're interested in, uh, I'm told by the organizers that you can stay tuned late summer to understand uh, what format decision has been made subject to uh, you know, vaccine availability and safety and whatnot. So, so today I want to tell you about four topics. <clears throat> I originally yesterday when I was preparing my slides had these two topics first, since these two are ones that are more directly uh, um, known to the, uh, to the string theory community. But then I was starting to realize that coming with Calabiao metrics and not talking first about what a neural network even is uh, seemed like the wrong order. So what I'm going to tell you about first is uh, a correspondence between neural networks and quantum field theory that is trying to get at uh, a better understanding of what a neural network actually is and how we should understand it. And the claim is, is that we should be thinking about techniques from effective field theory to understand neural networks better. And I'm going to tell you about a recent result from my group called Symmetry via Duality, where we will uh, be able to use duality to determine the symmetries of neural network effective field theories. Another is that I'm going to tell you about so-called generative models, uh, and specifically a type of generative model called equivariant flows. And I'll try to explain to you why this is particularly important for lattice QCD. Uh, many places in physics, including in string theory and also in lattice QCD, sampling problems are very important. And uh, in, in the context of applying generative models and equivariant flows to lattice QCD, we're learning to sample in uh, intelligent ways that uh, help the lattice QCD process. Then I'll tell you, then we'll take a break. And then I'll, we'll come back and I'll tell you about Calabiao metrics and a review of recent optimization works that are out there. And I'll also tell you about knots and natural language. In particular, I'll tell you about explicit unknotting and automating topology. So the first bit that I want to tell you about is uh, a, a correspondence between neural networks and quantum field theory that is trying to drive home a little more what, what really is a neural network. And I'm going to give you an effective field theory approach uh, uh, way of understanding this and also uh, uh, introduce a notion of how we can understand symmetries in that context. So uh, it's based on a number of works that are listed here. I encourage you to check out the references afterwards. So, so neural networks are the, the linchpin of the progress in deep learning. There are different types of deep learning pipelines, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish. So there's supervised learning where the neural network learns to predict outputs given inputs. So for example, it needs to say that that's a three and that that's a three and that that's a three. But there's another, there's another type of uh, deep learning pipeline called a generative model, 
where the neural network instead is trying to take some draws from some simple distribution like a multivariate Gaussian, that is take noise draws and use those noise draws to produce something that is interesting, to simulate something that's interesting or fake something that's interesting like this human face here that uh, looks like a human, but actually this person doesn't exist. This was generated by the neural network. Uh, famously, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, which is a technique by which the agent learns to, uh, a neural network is an agent that learns to act better over time and improve its behavior over time. Um, uh, that was used uh, by DeepMind uh, in AlphaGo and in AlphaZero to become a world uh, champion beating program in Go and in chess and other games. And finally, uh, in natural language, the neural network is a powerful function that uh, extends a sequence given a prompt, for instance, it does many other things too. Okay, <clears throat> but what really is a neural network? Well, um, in some sense, a neural network is a powerful function. So there are universal approximation theorems for neural networks that tell you uh, of a given type of architecture to a given desired amount of accuracy, uh, a neural network is a universal approximator, meaning that it's very powerful. Uh, but it's in some sense just a function. And uh, in particular, uh, it, we can think of it as a function from some input space to some output space with some continuous learnable hyperparameter theta and some discrete hyperparameter n that enters uh, into the architecture in some way, shape, or form. And I'll give you examples of these n's. And the basic idea is that at the beginning of time, when you fire up your code, you initialize your thetas by drawing them from some distribution, like a multivariate Gaussian. And then via some training mechanism, the uh, parameters are updated so as to improve performance. So that's the basic idea of how neural networks are used in deep learning. So there's some function with some parameters where the parameters are drawn from a distribution. So if you fire up your code and you have it create a neural network, it's a random function because those parameters are uh, draws, they're random variable draws from some distribution. So there's some randomness intrinsic to the function itself. And if you fire up your code again and you haven't set the seed to, to fix the random number generator, it's another random function because you get a different draw of parameters. And if you do it again and again and again, what you get is all different neural networks that are all random functions drawn from some distribution. And that's the key thing that if the neural network is a random function, we have to ask the question from what distribution. So in particular, we normally think of neural networks as having an architecture with random parameters, but they're also random functions. And we could choose if it was tractable to instead study them in function space, not thinking of them as a random function generated by its parameters, created by its parameters, but instead just of a function from some function space distribution. And so that's sort of the central part of this first part, uh, the central point of this first part of the talk. We want to ask the question, what distribution are these random functions drawn from, these neural networks? And I want to sharpen this with the simplest example that's out there. So this is a result due to Neil from the 1990s, I believe as a part of his PhD thesis. So a single layer feed forward network uh, is just some function that maps some input space with weights and biases where these weights and biases are drawn from some distributions according to over here. And it takes the input X from here and it acts on it as W is zero X plus B. And these parameters drop us into RN. And then there's some n element-wise nonlinearity sigma that acts on that vector in Rn, that gives us something else in Rn, what's called the post activation here. And then finally, we're going to map this to some output space by another affine transformation parametrized by W1 and B1. And these Ws and Bs are called weights and biases, respectively. But they're parameters that are drawn when you fire up your code that define your initial neural network. And the limit of interest that sharpens this question of what distribution are, the, are these neural networks drawn from is the infinite width limit. And the crucial thing to note is that this matrix, so, so, so this f of x is a, a vector that lives in R to the d out, where d out is the output dimension. And w1 is an n by d out matrix with entries that are drawn independently and identically distributed from some distribution. So that this matrix acting on this Rn vector here to produce an Rd out vector, uh, what it does is it's adding up n variables in that matrix multiplication, n iid uh, parameters, 
And in particular, this is the context in which the central limit theorem applies. So each entry in the output vector is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So uh, concretely, this is, this is the central thing. Uh, this neural network is said to be drawn from a Gaussian process, uh, which doesn't appear as regularly in high energy theory, but is a fairly common thing, for instance, in astrophysics. And the basic idea, if you're not too familiar with these, but you are familiar with quantum field theory, is that you can just think of this as a Gaussian distribution on function space. So this is the central idea. In this simple single layer feed forward network, because this W1 is uh, a, an n by d out matrix, as you take n to infinity, a given row in that matrix multiplication is adding, when it contracts with the vector, n iid random variables, the central limit theorem applies, and the output is drawn from Gaussian. So that's, that's true. On, on the one hand, I gave you a very specific architecture here, but all it really relied on was the central limit theorem. So you might imagine that this phenomenon of a neural network output being drawn from a Gaussian distribution on function space is a much more general thing, and that's true. So most architectures admit a Gaussian, this is called a Gaussian process limit, a limit as n goes to infinity where the architecture is drawn from Gaussian. Most architectures admit a Gaussian process limit. So for example, the example I just gave you are the single layer, layer infinite width feed forward networks, but also deep infinite width feed forward networks are Gaussian processes. So this is a, a case where you, deep networks are a case where you iterate this procedure over and over again. Uh, and there's many, many other architectures. A neural network architecture is, is the way that you compose little functions to create a big function that is the neural network. That's, that, that's what an architecture is. And uh, there are many, many different architectures that admit a limit of this type. Another thing that's interesting is that this property uh, persists under certain types of training of the network. And this is a, um, this is a nice property because it means that the analysis that we're gonna do throughout which requires being near a GP limit can persist under certain types of training. I'm sorry, I lost my presentation. There we go. Okay. So um, on, the one, on the one hand, neural networks are drawn from a Gaussian process. We don't normally put it in this statistical language, but free quantum field theory is also a Gaussian process. So uh, if this is the path integral of our Euclidean quantum field theory, where we have an integral over the space of fields, e to the minus s of phi, s of phi is of course the action. For scalar field theory, s of phi is given by this. I will note that uh, this scalar field theory action is quadratic in the integration variable phi. There's an operator that ties them together, uh, phi box plus m squared phi, but this is Gaussian in the phi's. And in particular, this is why we can exactly solve free field theory, uh, because we know how to do the Gaussian integrals associated with the, this Gaussian process. So in particular, all of the uh, correlation functions or higher moments of this uh, distribution on function space can be computed because it's Gaussian. So uh, concretely, the statistics, those higher moments are determined entirely by the one point function, which is the mean and the two point function, which is known as the Gaussian process kernel. And you can compute correlators in terms of Feynman diagrams. So let me give you an example. Um, so uh, I, I should say that the, the correlation function, if this is the distribution associated with free field theory, the correlation function is just the expectation value uh, of some product of phi. So the endpoint function is the expectation value of phi of x1 through phi of xn evaluated in this distribution. So uh, in particular, the four point function uh, looks like this. So the four point function, when you compute it for the Gaussian process associated with free field theory is a product of two point functions where you can say for every K, I'm gonna draw a line for every K X1, X2, I'm gonna draw a line from X1 to X2, uh, K X3, X4 is X3 to X4. And there's this way re of representing uh, these correlation functions graphically. And uh, of course, we know these from quantum field theory. These are Feynman diagrams. And here, they're Feynman diagrams that represent the, uh, the correlation functions of neural network outputs, which in this infinite limit are Gaussian. Okay. In particular, you'll notice that none of these are interacting theory Feynman diagrams. These are particles that are just flying past each other in, in field theory language. And uh, that's because the theory is Gaussian, the theory is not interacting. Okay. But what if we do finite end networks? So the function space distribution is generally non-Gaussian but the non-Gaussianities go to zero as n goes to infinity. So if you are at large but finite n, 
the non-Gaussianities in the distribution uh, would correspond to weakly coupled interactions uh, in the quantum field theory. Remember from your quantum field theory course that uh, the free theory is Gaussian, and then we turn on small non-Gaussianities that are the interaction. So in the example that I just gave, lambda phi to the fourth is the canonical thing that we turn on, uh, uh, the small non-Gaussianity that we turn on, and then we do perturbation theory in lambda, right? So, um, Right. So, so, uh, right. So, so at finite n, what you can do is set up a context where you take the effective action of the Gaussian process and the associated correlations, and then you model some delta s. You try to write down some delta s that models the non-Gaussianities of, of the neural networks, and uh, this is what we do in effective field theory. So, all of these are higher than quadratic in the neural network f of x. And because of that, these are all local higher order interactions. These are non-Gaussianities. Um, to the extent that this is a good model in, a, in any given neural network architecture, all of these have to go to zero as n goes to infinity because you have to recover Gaussianity. And what we, what we did in our original work is to uh, set up a context by which we can think of a Wilsonian effective field theory approach to understanding neural networks. And we sort of go on and on and on in that, in that direction. So um, this isn't too important to the rest of the talk. I just wanted to give you the, the sketch of what one might try to do in this context. And, and given such a delta S, of course, you can, just like you do in quantum field theory, do perturbations in the small parameters associated with the non-Gaussianities, which are small because as n goes to infinity, the network has to become Gaussian. And, and by doing perturbation theory in those, you can write down Feynman diagram expressions for the correlation functions of, of neural network outputs at finite n. Okay, so all of this was revolving around the question of what really is a neural network? Well, at large but finite n, it's a random function drawn from a close to Gaussian distribution. And in particular, if you were to model interactions by trying to write down uh, non-Gaussian corrections in some delta s, the effective action that cor corresponds to the interactions, you might then try to you do neural network experiments to constrain the form of delta, e delta s make new predictions and then try to verify those predictions. And uh, a concrete way in physics language to say what this is, is that this is exactly neural network phenomenology. That what we're doing in particle phenomenology is that there's some a, a system that we really care about. It's a statistical system called the, called the standard model or the beyond, beyond the standard model. We do a bunch of experiments of scattering amplitudes and uh, you know, which are related to correlation functions. And uh, from that, we write we, we try to come up with models for delta s in particle physics, which correspond to some new particles that we add to the theory and how they interact with known particles. And uh, that's phenomenology. And we try to constrain the form of delta s for beyond the standard model physics using beyond the standard model physics experiments. Right? In this context, what you would do is write down delta s to try to model neural networks. It's neural network phenomenology, if you'd like. And uh, one might hope to do this for state of the art networks like transformers. but um, I think the basic point is that, that this could lead to some conceptual breakthroughs in our understanding of machine learning, uh, because if you can understand the distribution uh, uh, that neural networks are drawn from before they're trained, and then understand what happens to them as they train, that's sort of the central thing in machine learning, as we'll review in a moment. So in particular, the one point function of the trained network distribution is the central object in, in supervised learning. OK. Um, so. The idea that I gave you already is that neural network phenomenology uh, can come into the game and uh, that there's a reason that you're close to Gaussian, the neural networks are drawn from a close, in depth, close to Gaussian distribution at large n. And so <clears throat> you can use experiments to constrain the effective action. But we might want to ask, uh, can you do better than that? Are there other theoretical con considerations that allow you to constrain the neural network effective action? And uh, for this, I want to tell you about how you can use duality, a duality frame, to understand symmetries of the unknown neural network distribution over functions. So we know that it's close to Gaussian, but without some work, we don't know what the non-Gaussianities are that correct the Gaussian process. Um, so so uh, in this context, I want to tell you about how we can use duality to uh, figure out symmetries um, of the neural network effective action. And it goes like this. So uh, as we know from quantum field theory, uh, classical symmetries can be deduced via a study of the action itself. But for quantum symmetries, we want to study the correlation functions. 
Uh, and crucially, these correlation functions, this expectation value of product of neural networks evaluated on X1 through Xn, uh, these can be evaluated not just in function space, but also in parameter space. So in particular, the canonical way that people in machine learning compute these correlation functions, and there's not that many people that are, that are doing this, it's fairly uh, theoretical, uh, is, is to integrate uh, uh, over all of the parameters theta in your neural network this uh, is these are concrete f of x's in actual examples take the product of f of x's and integrate it against the distribution associated with the parameters and uh when we uh when we try to understand um okay good let me uh say an extra word depending on yeah good so 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 this is a different way to compute correlation functions than we normally do in quantum field theory in quantum field theory, we normally compute correlation functions in a path integral formulation or uh, canonical quantization formulation. formulation. Uh, and in the path integral, we're doing a function space approach where we use the function space effective action to compute the correlation functions. And my entire point is sort of that this is a totally different way to compute the correlation functions, right? So uh, if we were to do a transformation on Fs, for example, if these are some vectors at output and we were to rotate them, uh, if we were to then cast them into a, an original form, uh, sorry, if you were to transform those Fs, uh, then you could absorb those uh, and cast those Fs into an original form by redefining the parameters, by absorbing the transformation to the parameters. And if the measure and distribution are invariant uh, in this expression for the correlation function, then the correlation function is itself. So F transforms you absorb that into the parameters, you use it to redefine the parameters, and under that redefinition, if d theta and p theta are invariant, then so are the correlation functions. Okay. So, so this question amounts to whether or not p theta is itself invariant, and in many cases it is, uh, that, that I'll show you in an example. But, but this is the big conceptual point, that uh, via using this parameter space duality frame and the correlator computation, we can deduce the existence of symmetries of the action, even if we don't know what it is. So this provides constraints for effective modeling of neural network distributions. Just to give you a super concrete example, in the case that this is our neural network, this is the case of the single layer, uh, it's not even a single layer feed forward network. This is any network with a uh, linear output layer. Remember these Ws and Bs are called weights and biases. They're drawn from some distribution <clears throat> and um, these uh, weights and biases act on post the, the so-called post activation, which you can just think of as a complicated function that depends on the input X. And uh, what we want to ask is what happens to the correlation functions under an SO rotation, right? So if FJ maps to RIJ at FJ, where RIJ is an SO, uh, an SO N matrix, oh, okay, sorry, an SO output dimension matrix, we want to ask are the correlation functions invariant under this transformation? So this is the transformed correlation function. You can see that the rotation matrix is acting on the network output in all of the cases. These Rs, when they act on these Ws, this is matrix matrix multiplication. So we will define Rw to be W twiddle. This is the redefinition of the parameters that I mentioned. Uh, and then we uh, have this function of these W twiddles. And we ask, can we do um, a transformation on the W twiddles uh, such that um, when we absorb them into the measure and into the parameter distribution here, it leaves everything invariant and it shows that the correlation functions are invariant and, and it does um, the details work out. So uh, in the paper that we just put out, there's uh, examples with other lead groups, but, but the result is, is that in this simple case and in many other cases, you can use the correlation functions that you compute in parameter space and their transformation properties to deduce the symmetries uh, of densities over functions associated with neural networks. That is to deduce what symmetries the neural network effective actions have to have. Um, and it's kind of for free. This is a very simple result. This is like a little quarter page calculation that you can do to show that this super famous case has SO symmetry. Um, and finally, uh, maybe in the interest of time, based on, on, on where I'm at and that I have a whole another whole half, I'll tell you that we did some experiments in this context. What we asked is, does the amount of symmetry at initialization, all, all of this analysis that I just told you about, allows me to ask questions like, what is the amount of symmetry for randomly initialized neural networks that I then might train with, right? And there's two parameters uh, that, uh, that 
arise in this context. From a physics perspective, they basically control the amount of breaking, uh, that is the vacuum expectation value, uh, or the mean of the distribution, if you would like. And they also can control uh, how many breaking parameters you turn on. So if you have SO uh, D out symmetry, do you break to some subgroup or do you break all the way? And uh, what I'll show you uh, as th there's more to it, but what I'll show you is that this, this direction is uh, controlling the, the uh, vacuum expectation value. This direction is controlling uh, the number of components that you turn a VEV on along. Uh, and uh, what we're doing is this is this is the uh, symmetry breaking at initialization. So we break to SO 10 minus K, 10 because we're doing a classification problem on, on fashion MNIST, which is a particular data set. And what we see is that after training, the amount of uh, accuracy that you get correlates directly with how much symmetry breaking you do at initialization. So uh, how much symmetry you have in the neural networks before you train seems to affect how well things do when it does train. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, and, and just to conclude this section, what I'll say is, you know, if that's a neural network, then what is learning? Um, hopefully by now I've reminded you just the way we saw this red dot drop out of the sky, if that's a randomly initialized neural network somewhere in function space, my, my point is, is that if we train that thing, this little green dot that is the trained neural network goes off somewhere in function space and comes back and converges. But that's just one neural network draw. There's nothing fundamental about that whatsoever. The fundamental thing, if you keep doing it again and again, two untrained becomes the green dot two that's trained. If you do it again and again and again, it becomes clear that the fundamental thing in this problem, even though it's in general intractable, is the density over functions, the distribution over functions associated with randomly initialized neural networks and the density over functions associated with the train distribution of neural networks. And then in that context, learning is the process by which the distribution over functions, which is kind of like the ones that arise in quantum field theory, uh, the, uh, it, it's, the, it, it's the process by which this distribution flows from initialization to the train distribution. Okay. So in physics language, learning is a data-induced flow from an, an initialization function space distribution to a train distribution. And uh, it, from a Bayesian perspective, learning is approximating the posterior over functions given a prior a likelihood and data. Okay. So um, the symmetry things that I mentioned there don't have anything to do with the symmetry things that I'll mention in a moment. Um, I am roughly on target time-wise that went a little longer than expected, but I have a little less to say in this section. This first part of the lecture is 45 minutes long and at some point we're gonna have discussions. So um, I wanna be sure to get to that too. Um, should I re reserve questions for the end? Peter, Fabian, Patrick, Koji? Well, I guess if, if there are questions, they can be asked. Yeah. Are there questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. So sure. re regarding your last slide. <clears throat> this one. Yeah, so the, the axis, is it like the function space or the um target space because i got a, a bit confused about the if we're talking about the function space meaning like all the possible neural networks we can build or if the neural network is actually uh capturing uh some distribution that we want right in, in supervised learning i'm just uh i don't i don't understand the x-axis here if if it's really function space or if it's the target distribution that we want? It's the target, it, it, what we want is the train distribution on function space. That's that's the central thing in supervised learning. Should I say more? Yeah, can you also repeat, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Add an, so if you were to if you were to take a hundred neural networks randomly initialized and use them on some data set you care about for predictions, they'd be terrible, right? Um, point number one is that those hundred neural networks are just a hundred draws from some distribution on function space at, at initialization. That's this. That's rep, what's represented in this figure. For any given one of those neural networks, like this one too, this uh, during training will go somewhere else, like over here. So this initialization neural network number two becomes this other one. 
And so if you were to do this in ensemble, recognizing that the randomly initialized neural networks are just some ensemble of neural networks drawn from some distribution, yes, it, the distribution matters. And yes, the fact that it's a distribution on functions matters. Then what happens during training is that that whole distribution flows to some train distribution. And what one would want to do in supervised learning is compute the one point function of this train distribution. That is, if you only train one neural network, you don't have, and it converged, you don't have anything to do but to take that, uh, the, the, the only thing that you really can do is take that neural network and evaluate it on some inputs and see how it does with respect to the loss. But if you have 100 of those, what you should really do is take the average prediction across those 100 neural networks, right, if they're all trained. And if, if you had an infinity of those neural networks uh, from the train distribution, if you really were very powerful and you trained all of those, you would still want the average prediction unless you had a reason to think that one was much better than the other. And what that average prediction of those trained neural networks is, is the one point function of this train distribution. So that, that's what I'm saying. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Sure. It's an unusual way to think about supervised learning um, because in reality, we fire up one neural network and we train it. But, um, but, but really the fundamental thing I think is the distribution of the functions. And that's certainly the way that a Bayesian would think about it. At least the Bayesians I've talked to. So, anyone else? I have a question. Yes. It seems to me that the output space is has much smaller dimensionality than the function space. And you really only care about the output space, right? The whatever your output nodes give. And there may well be many different functions where there are network architectures, therefore functions that give you basically the same output, right? Yes. Isn't that a problem? Um, from a practical point of view, you mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, in some sense, this is uh, uh, the, the high dimensionality of function space versus the relatively low dimensionality or finite dimensionality of output space. Yeah, I mean, that is a huge discrepancy. Um, but one thing that I would note is that sometimes in these infinite limits, things do become tractable in a way that you don't expect. So for instance, just to be super concrete, um, what I mentioned is that you would want, you would in general want uh, for supervised learning, the mean of the train distribution as a function, yeah? And uh, in this infinite neural network limit, what you recover is, is what's called the neural net Gaussian process because it's a Gaussian process, you can actually do exact Bayesian training to compute the Bayesian posterior and compute the associated mean on that infinite dimensional function space on that Gaussian process. So um, it seems a little counterintuitive, but um, at large n, some of these things that seem completely intractable are becoming, are becoming tractable because even though the dimension, um, e even, though, even though the dimension of the hidden layers is going up and up and up, uh, the central limit theorem is making the statistics simpler. Um, so that's sort of the trade-off that's happening. But, in, but indeed, um, you know, um, from a function space perspective, what one would like is the, is the mean of the train distribution. And whether that's computable in any given case is, is uh, subject to a detailed analysis. But in certain cases, that thing's computable. So in particular, infinite neural networks trained uh, with uh, gradient descent on MSE loss, or alternatively, uh, exact Bayesian training on the associated Gaussian process, both of those admit tractable means. Does that help? Yeah, help? thanks. Yeah, sure. It's a very good question. A lot of this is a little counterintuitive. <clears throat> and um, indeed, I, I know many of you have thought uh, or worked on a, a good bit of aspects of machine learning. This is sort of turning the normal story on its head, thinking about things from function space rather than from parameter space. And one of the things that's true of this duality of these two dual ways of thinking a parameter space and a function space view is that just like in dualities in physics, uh, as one description becomes simpler, the other one becomes harder usually. So in particular, as the number of parameters goes to infinity, uh, you have this overparameterization problem, and yet the statistics of the neural network distributions is becoming more and more and more Gaussian. Uh, on the other hand, at small n, like n is two or n is three, when we are thinking of QCD uh, as an analogy, uh, then these one over n corrections are presumably completely out of control, and the theory is just not a perturbation around the Gaussian fixed point at all. So, yeah. Can I also ask a short question? What's that? Can I ask a short question? Yeah, sure. Um, 
So concerning this duality between functions and parameters. Yes. Um, and how far does this help you to determine the effect of action? And how far do these symmetries help you to determine the effect of action and function space? So you had this delta S where you had some parameters f of x cubed, f of x of four, and so on. Yeah, that's right. Now in quantum field theory, of course, you have the naturalness, or you have this theorem that everything that's not forbidden is allowed. So you should write down any term that's not forbidden by a symmetry. That's right. Um, so does the same apply to neural networks? So let's say you. I mean, first of all, you, of course, I understand you don't have a guiding principle in that you don't have, I don't know. So when you write down physical theory, you write down, write it down such that it conserves Lorentz symmetry or so. Yes. And then you have some, then you write down everything that's Lorentz invariant, for example. Mm -hmm. Of course, you don't have that, but if you choose your parameters to follow from some random, I don't know, random Gaussian draws or so, then you get some rotation symmetry and so on. Yeah. So this then tells, does this tell, tell you how, which terms you should write down? Or could it be that sort of some terms that are compatible with the symmetry, are, you shouldn't, still shouldn't write down, they're not generated or what's, what's yeah. not? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say from an effective field theory point of view, you should write down all terms consistent with the symmetry and then use experiments to measure the parameters or the functions associated with those interactions, right? And, um, in every case that I know, all terms allowed by symmetry to any given truncation in the perturbation theory have non-trivial coefficients associated with them, um, which is your question effectively, right? Yeah. So, you, so you have something like naturalness. So not, no, none of these parameters are small if they are not forbidden. That's right. Although I would say that um, we had some, in our first paper, we had some initial results related to technical naturalness. So there's this idea in particle physics that parameters are allowed to be small if, uh, if in the limit that they go to zero, there's a symmetry. And um, we, we, we studied technical naturalness a little bit in our first paper. I think that uh, it seemed to work there, but I'd like a firmer understanding of it before I claim that it's something fairly common. Um, I would point out though, that in some sense, in some of these neural networks, the situation's better than it is in physics. Because the only reason we would demand Lorentz and very effective field theories is because the, the, every experiment we've ever done suggests uh, that you know Lorentz invariance is a good idea. Um, but and you could you could you could test for symmetries experimentally in the neural network similarly. But duality is actually better because it tells you that something def definitively holds. It's not subject to experimental error. There's a theoretical calculation that you do in the other duality frame that tells you what the symmetry is, and then that constrains the effective action. So um, as you know, like in, in ON, in the ON vector model in, in scalar field theory, having that ON symmetry greatly reduces the types of interactions you can write down. Um, but indeed, consistent with the symmetries, I'd write down everything unless you have a, a, a reason to, to think that something else is zero or small. Does that answer your question, Fabian? Yes, thank you. Cool. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to the next part. I'm gonna try to be good with everyone's time and, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> so so uh, I want to tell you also about generative models, equivariant flows, and lattice QCD. This is not my work, so I'm going to do my damn best to try to explain this as clearly as I can. Um, so the basic idea is that in many many places in science and in physics, there's intelligent sampling that we want to do. In particular, um, in string theory, we would like to understand how to under how to sample the string landscape better. In lattice QCD, we want to sample gauge field configurations, and ideally, we want to be able to be sure that the, the things that we're sampling are coming from the desired distribution, and also we want to be able to account for symmetries. Right? Um, there's a, a beautiful uh, set of works that are arising in the last uh, six years in this direction, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Thank you very much to Fiala Shanahan for providing some slides on uh, because this is her work, not mine. So, so the, I, the central idea of generative models in this context is that we're learning to generate or fake or simulate data. So in this case, it's very different from supervised learning. The neural network learns to map noise drawn from some distribution, P of n, to draws from some target data distribution. So um, in particular, if you think of uh, uh, some n by n images with grayscale pixels, right? Grayscale pixels are under certain conventions um, normalized between zero and 255. You have an n by n grid with a zero to 255 value at each thing there. And if you were to draw pixels from a uniform distribution, you would get noise, right? At the same time, in that space, the pixels with the zero to 255 entries, there is uh, there is a, uh, an image, there is an element of that space 
that looks exactly like my face or like your face up to, you know, small noise and whatnot. So uh, that picture of you or me or of someone else is very, very rare if one were to draw from a uniform distribution on that space. But what one would like to do if you're simulating is to have a neural network learn how to uh, learn how to draw from a distribution over that space of images such that you, it's increasingly likely to have uh, a, an image produced that looks like a real person. And that's what's happening here in, in all of these generative models. You draw some multivariate Gaussian noise, you shove it through a trained neural network, and it produces pictures like this, right? And so in particular, uh, these people don't exist. And yet, if I were to, uh, OK, so they, it, it appears that it was trained on people that uh, you know, have very symmetric faces and, uh, you know, could be actors or actresses. If I put these people in a lineup of actors and actresses, um, or maybe actors and actresses that you're less likely to be able to identify, you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick out that these aren't real people. Uh, it's pretty convincing, and this is, this is uh, a, a pretty impressive technique, I think. So the idea is to turn noise into some draws from some target data distribution, uh, for example, there's uh, there's some work uh, simulating J4, which is a, it, itself an electromagnetic calorimeter sim simulator associated with LHC physics. Uh, and there's some work from 2018 that uses generative models to simulate that. And some uh, uh, Cody and I have uh, some some work from uh, last year that tries to do this in string theory. But the basic idea is to come up with some useful simulator where the neural network takes draws from some simple distribution and turns it into draws from some distribution that you care about. Okay, so generating or uh, generating faces and faking data is cool, uh, and in particular, these target data distributions that I'm talking about, whether it be faces or lattice QCD gauge fields or string vacua or whatever, uh, those are in general implicit unless you do some extra work. You know that there's a distribution and that you're drawing from something, but you don't actually know the probability of any of the generated data. So the question in this context becomes, what's the, what's the probability of this face, for instance? And this is where the technique called normalizing flows, which is a particular type of generative model, comes in. The basic idea is that you draw some noise from some simple density row on the input space, like a multivariate Gaussian. You train a network F theta, which is mapping Rn to Rn in this simple case, um, to produce interesting samples like faces or LHC events or alphanetic terms or lattice gauge fields. And then crucially, this right here is the normal generative pipe, uh, model pipeline. The additional assumption of the normalizing flow is that the network itself is a diffeomorphism, which yields a tractable density by a change of variables. So um, X is like the face, Z is the multivariate no, uh, Gaussian noise draw from this simple density row, which could be multivariate Gaussian. F is the neural network that when trained maps me from that simple draw to the complicated sample. And via this formula, uh, you can figure out what the density of that uh, particular face or lattice gauge field or whatnot is, right? So this is a whole subject in, in machine learning with uh, various complicated architectures and tricks. One of the crucial tricks is this Jacobian, uh, because you're uh, taking the determinant across all of these variables, this can become rather intractable. And so one trick that people use is that they try to engineer Jacobians that are upper triangular. So that instead of computing the determinant, you just take the product down the diagonal. Yeah. Um, but but this, is, this is a key difference. This is a case where not only can you generate samples, but you can also predict the probability of that generated sample under the, under the distribution induced by the neural network. So this, this is a fundamental conceptual difference. And the reason that you might ask that for whether you can use that for lattice field theory is that for any fixed lattice theory, we have a Euclidean action that we want to sample from, from a known density on the field space. Right? So in lattice QCD, uh, probably do not need to remind you, this is a numerical first principles approach to non-perturbative QCD. Uh, you're in 4D, 4D Euclidean space time. Uh, there's a lattice with non-zero lattice spacing where we worry about how the lattice size L is scaling because that really uh, affects what's going on. And the basic idea is to approximate the QCD path integral by, by Markov chain Monte Carlo. And so the expectation value of some observable that one would want to compute theoretically uh, becomes a sum over gauge field configurations U that have been sampled from the right distribution according to the lattice QCD action. Right? 
So this is ultimately, uh, amongst other things, this is a sampling problem. To be able to do lattice QCD properly, you need at scale to be able to sample from the right distribution and compute the expectation values of observables in that, in that uh, sorry, in that sample. Okay. So uh, in this context, uh, gauge field configurations are generated with some probability uh, e to the minus s, where s is the action, and uh, some, some details that aren't too important for what I'm going to say today is that the gauge field configurations um, you know, uh, in actual QCD are represented by links encoded as SU3 matrices because you're doing SU3 QCD instead of SUN because that's what the real world is. And uh, you know, configurations are sampled from the probability distribution according to the lattice QCD action, and weighted averages are, are computed to determine the physical configurations of interest. Um, but at its essence, uh, the central problem is being sure that you sample gauge field configurations from the right distribution. And so what the way that this is often done is to use Hamiltonian or hybrid Monte Carlo uh, to uh, generate uh, new, to, to roll the dice, to play the Monte Carlo game, to generate gauge field configurations such that as you do it more and more and more, uh, you're guaranteed via the Markov chain that you're sampling from the right distribution. Crucially in this process, uh, what, what can happen is that there's a burn-in time and correlation uh, length associated with the Markov chain by which the gauge field configuration you, you produce at time t, t plus one, et cetera, as you change the parameters of the system, it's less and less likely to be uncorrelated. You have to worry that there are going to be correlations uh, that mean that you're not sampling fairly from, from the distribution that's desired. So as this autocorrelation and burn-in happens, it means that uh, there's less and less reliable results coming from the lattice. Okay, so uh, uh, the problem, this problem of having these correlations burn in is called critical slowing down as the lattice goes to, as the lattice size go to zero or alternatively the sites go to infinity, the autocorrelation time explodes and this slows down the generation of uncorrelated samples. So what this group has, has, has suggested is that in the Markov chain process by which you are moving along and generating by a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, draws from, from the distribution, um, instead of uh, at, at, this, at this crucial stage here between time slice t and t plus one, instead of uh, using the previous sample and then some modification of it to uh, generate a new sample, what they're proposing is using a trained neural network, the uh, normalizing flow, the trained normalizing flow, to not based on the previous sample, just whole hog uh, suggest a new field configuration to go through the Markov chain except for Jack's step. And um, this is the central idea. They have, uh, this, is, this is completely new to this paper from 2018, I believe. Instead of updating based on the previous state, instead the neural network just tries to produce a sample whole hog new without, uh, without relying on the previous state. So uh, as they say, the generating samples is embarrassingly parallel. Uh, a crucial thing that one might intuitively imagine is because the samples that are generated for the, for the Markov chain except reject step are not dependent on the previous sample, uh, that this might really help the autocorrelation problem and the critical slowing down. And so they do this in scalar field theory. Uh, the hybrid Monte Carlo results uh, have an autocorrelation time as a function of lattice size that scale as uh, L to, I don't know what these, there's three Ls here, L to some power that's polynomial. This one's clear. This is the local metropolis ensemble. So this is, uh, this is uh, a standard Markov chain Monte Carlo approach. This scale is like L to the two, L to the 1.37, L to the 1.46, depending on what observable you're studying. And what their main result is, is that via having this generative model uh, uh, approach to the Markov chain, uh, they are able to show that it's scaling as L to some small power, suggesting that it's constant in L. So uh, this autocorrelation that can mess with lattice calculations as, uh, as the system is scaled up seems under much better control when you use the normalizing flow to make the proposal for the accept reject step for the next field configuration. So um, very good. Um, the, the last thing that I want to say uh, in this part of the talk, uh, conceptually, the last result is that this is just scalar field theory. This is not QCD or Yang-Mills that's on, on this slide. So this is sort of a step one of doing machine learning for Lattice to, uh, 
have this normalizing flow that is making the proposal for the accept reject step of the, of the Markov chain. If you really wanted to do QCD or Yang Mills, first of all, you need to keep in mind that your, your fields are now going to be valued on compact manifolds. Uh, and then the other is that the target densities must be G invariant, right? So um, th there are symmetries of the QCD action and the Yang Mills action that um, th there's more to say about this, but, but, uh, but basically we want to make sure that the symmetries are coming into the game in a natural way. So uh, what to do this, uh, the newest papers use what's called an equivariant normalizing flow. So remember the normalizing flow is the generative model that gets a tractable density so that we can be sure that we're sort of approaching the, the right uh, Euclidean action. But sometimes we want not only tractable densities, but tractable densities that have symmetries. The upshot of this theorem from this nice paper, which I showed here whole hog because it's stated so clearly and concisely, is that if the simple density rho on the input space is G invariant and the function itself is G equivariant, meaning that uh, if, if this is the symmetry, the symmetry acting on the input then acted on by the neural network. Uh, sorry, this is the density. Um, where am I? I'm a little turned around. I, I'm, at, I'm looking at the wrong spot. Um, the, the symmetry acting on the input acted on by the neural network is equal to the symmetry acting on the neural network acting on the input itself. This commutation of F and RH is what's called equivariance. And if the density at input, the simple one, is G invariant and the flow is equivariant, then the target density itself is G invariant. So this is how they, uh, in, in the recent papers from last year, this is how they ensure that the generative model is not just generating samples, but is generating samples from a, from a symmetric distribution. Okay, and they have, they have an example where they apply it to U1 field theory, and the results are quite good for the correlation time for the flows relative to the, uh, the conventional approaches. And uh, finally, uh, this is a paper from last year. They're even now able to construct SUN gauge equivariant flows, which would be a crucial step towards doing uh, full lattice QCD using these techniques. So this story is not complete, and this group is still working in this direction. I think other groups are too. Uh, Akio Tomiya is doing some things similar to this. And this would be a fantastic application of machine learning physics, tackling one of the most significant bottlenecks in non-perturbative gauge theory, namely being sure that you sample from the distribution uh, that you think you are. Um, okay, um, and, and doing it in a way that improves upon traditional sampling techniques. So I told you about a little bit about a neural network quantum field theory correspondence. The neural network is drawn from a Gaussian process at infinite n. It's drawn from a non-Gaussian process at large but finite n, and the idea was to model these with effective field theory techniques. And I told you how you can use dual computations of the correlation functions to deduce their symmetry properties and therefore deduce the symmetries of the neural network effective actions that one would like to model. Um, and there was some ideas connecting accuracy and symmetry. Breaking. On the other hand, um, I also told you about generative models, equivariant flows, and lattice QCD. So generative models, the neural network learns a target data density. Uh, the normalizing flow is a sub genre of the generative models. And in this case, the uh, density is tractable. That is, you know the probability of the sample that you generate by a change of variables. The equivariant flows takes those normalizing flows where you have the tra tractable density and then also ensures that it's invariant under some symmetry. And this is really uh, important if one wants to speed up lattice QCD calculations, where we know that we're trying to sample from some G invariant density on functions. So the machine learning is fighting against the critical slowing down. The critical slowing down is the polynomial scaling with the lattice size here. And if you can see that in these results in two-dimensional scalar field theory, it's a lot. Okay, so um, looking ahead, uh, neural, network, uh, neural network quantum field theory correspondence, uh, there's training-induced density flows that we might be interested in trying to understand for the most successful architectures. Uh, generative models are giving rise to smarter sampling uh, uh, I'm sorry, this, this should have been changed. This is the conclusion for the, for the next part of the talk. Um, no, 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 that's what I meant to say. Uh, these generative models might be uh, useful in, in the next part of the talk for improving how we sample in, in learning to lobby metrics or towards motivating some better string cosmology. Uh, but I'll leave it there. That's the first part. And I, am, uh, I took, a, it took 55 minutes instead of uh, 45 minutes. I'm sorry about that, but... Uh, yeah, I'll try to be quicker next time around.
Any questions? Uh, Jim, may I have a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, in the second part, uh, so you introduced uh, this uh, lattice QCD uh, technique. Yeah. And there, uh, in fact, uh, the neural network architecture for the model uh, is actually well studied. So what kind of architecture is necessary to produce a good, um, good model for generating field configurations? Uh, sorry, what kind of, so you're asking what type of architecture do they use for these yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I don't yeah. remember the details. It's uh, mm. a fairly complicated architecture, if I recall. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, so, for example, um, I can't tell you the details. Okay, so, for for instance, step one of architecture is associated with normalizing flows, is mm. that you need to be sure um, that you can compute this Jacobian, uh, mm -hmm. this this Jacobian yeah. factor efficiently. Mm. So step one that people do in normalizing flows, and I think this was in the original paper, is to have some trick that allows you to compute this effectively. And there's different tricks for how that happens. One is to ensure that um, that the uh, uh, Jacobians, uh, that the matrix uh, is upper triangular so that the determinant is easily computable. Mm -hmm. That's a trick for normalizing flows that's an architecture trick. For equivariance, there's other tricks that come into the game. So for example, uh, to be able to get um, Right, to be able to get this property, which is crucial for the invariant densities, this equivariance property often involves some weight sharing of some particular type. So the tractable Jacobians, and I, I would say the tractable, tractable Jacobians to be able to compute the, uh, the target density together with the equivariance and the associated in commonly at least weight sharing, that that already produces some, some restrictions on the architecture. But uh, there's different ways that people do this and I forget exactly how they do it. Mm, so it certainly restricts the structure of the architecture. That's right. That's right. I mean, these are pretty non-trivial constraints, as you might imagine. That mm, yeah. um, you know, having that matrix, uh, that that Jacobian matrix, be have its determinant efficiently computable together with this equivariance property. They, these are restrictions. Mm. But if you can do that, uh, then you are able to uh, generate samples from this invariant density. Nice. Yeah, Thank you, thank you. I have one more question, which is vague, but uh, uh, would you, uh, do you have any connection between the first part, first part of your talk and the second part of your talk? In the first part, you introduced uh, this uh, neural network QFT uh, correspondence. Yeah. And then but, uh, you actually so have some application to QFT and then-, then I'm happy to speculate. Yeah. yeah, I'm happy to speculate. Um, that's not the slide I want. So, um, so, so broadly, uh, yeah. if neural networks are like, uh, are like quantum field theories in the sense that at large n, they're drawn from some close to Gaussian distribution. Mm -hmm. um, normally what we did in the first paper, one can turn the story on its head is to ask, given a fixed neural network ar architecture, what function at large n, what function space density does it induce? Mm -hmm. yeah. You can flip the question around to say, if I have a desired function space density that I wish to sample from, for example, scalar field theory or Yang Mills, can I come up with a neural network architecture that induces that density? Right? And uh, if you'd like, uh, in you know, in string theory, we we love papers called things like geometric engineering of quantum field theories. This would be a neural network engineering of a quantum field theory in the sense that the, the game is come up with a neural network architecture that induces a density over functions that is the density of functions of some Euclidean field theory that you care about. If you could do that, then for instance, you would be able to uh, apply it directly to lattice field theory, I think. Yeah. The crucial difference is that instead of a single neural network generating samples, the neural networks drawn from that distribution themselves are the samples. Mm -hmm. And this was something, this is what I mean here when I say that the, the symmetries I just derive are in the density over functions associated to an ensemble as opposed to the density over output space of a fixed neural network. Um, but indeed, this is one application I'm, I'm interested in trying to use this correspondence to be able to come up with a neural network architecture that, that gives you draws directly from distributions you care about. Oh, I see. Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. It's uh, very much work in progress, but uh, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Anyone else? 
So to continue this idea of Koji, yeah. let's say you, you were looking at this SON symmetry model, which you had in parameter space. Yes. And you were not at very large end, so that you were strongly coupled in some sense, so strongly coupled SON model. Uh, yes. You could study that itself with a, um, with a generated flow. Uh, yeah, so the gen so so yes, the ON vector model, uh, you could study with a generative flow model using these techniques that Fiala et al. have have developed. Um, so do you think there is a place for, let's say, lettuce lattice theory to analyze um, to analyze what neural networks do at small n? Or I mean, maybe it's yeah. maybe different questions or how small does n have to be in order to be weakly coupled? So of course doing, I don't know, doing a thousand hidden nodes in, in the layers, is this already very weakly coupled or is it, I mean, is this close to Gaussian or is this is this very far away? Yeah, so so we found- How large is n in some sense in order to get, to get close to, to the GP? Yeah, so, so in, the, in our experiments that we tested, one could probably be, do better analytics actually these days. But in our experiments from our first paper, at n of already 50 or even sometimes 10, um, you're already, the Gaussian process predictions are much larger than the corrections, the not Gaussian corrections to the correlation functions. And that can be measured, and we did. Um, so, so smaller n is perturbative, more perturbative than one might expect. But that can be also a function of the inputs that we chose. And that's why one would want some analytic control. Um, yeah, as far as using these ideas for lattice QCD, uh, the current story of Fiala et al. is to try to use the, a single trained neural network to produce field configurations from a desired density and use them in the Markov chain. Um, so it's a single neural network that generates many field configurations. Uh, in this other context that I mentioned, if one could apply it to Lattice, each neural network would itself be a field configuration. So that's a, it's conceptually different. This was uh, something I discussed with Danilo about 10 days ago when we were submitting our paper. It's not clear whether it'll work or be useful, but I think it's different at the very least. Regarding the last question, I think by Fabian on um, using field theory uh, methods to uh, study the behavior of neural networks. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you, um, it's not really a question, it's more like a, a comment. So there is a researcher in, uh, I think, Jerusalem called Zohar Hingel. Yes. And yeah. uh, he's a condensed he's a matter physicist by trade, as far as I know. And he has some interesting papers. Uh, from I think I believe 2020, where he uses replica field theory, which is something we use in the, like spin glasses, um, to study the behavior of uh, neural networks using just a purely uh, field theory techniques that we're used to. So if anyone is interested, it's, uh, it's also interesting to see his work. Absolutely. So I'm I'm familiar with um, a little bit of his work, but not the details. Indeed, he's he's using some rep replica stories that are. Um, analogous to what happens in, in systems like spin glasses. Uh, the approach that we took was sort of more of a direct perturbation approach around the Gaussian fixed point. Um, but I think that, I mean, all of these things, because I think trying to understand the densities over functions associated with neural networks is central in machine learning. Any, anything we can do to bring quantum field theory techniques to bear on those is, is potentially interesting and important. So. Yeah, those are, so, so uh, Zohar Ringel, if anyone didn't catch the name, he, he's done some uh, nice work in these directions. All right. Well, do we want to take a short break? No, I guess let's have a 10 minute break or so. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Very good. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So um, 
there's 40 minutes before my lecture is over. And so in this part, I'm going to be a little more high level in terms of emphasizing the main results and a little less down in the details. Uh, part three is about Calabia metrics. This is a review of three recent works from last December, including by uh, Fabian, who's in the audience. And uh, thanks to him for helping me with some of these slides. Uh, it saved me a lot of time. So uh, Calabia manifolds, you've probably heard a lot about over the years. These are uh, Kähler manifolds, complex Kähler manifolds with a uh, vanishing Ricci tensor. They're Ricci flat, so to say. And these are of fundamental interest in strings and algebraic geometry. Uh, string compactification is a story uh, by which we take higher dimensional string theory and go down to lower dimensions by making some of the extra dimensions of space compact and small. And the canonical context for doing that is in the context of Calabia manifolds. And uh, to remind you a little bit of this story, uh, there is a very famous theorem due to Yao that uh, I liked the way that Fabian put this in his slide, that Calabi in, in 54, in his conjecture, said that if some topological conditions are satisfied, namely the triviality of the canonical bundle or alternatively the vanishing first churn class of the tangent bundle, um, if some topological conditions are satisfied, then he conjectures that a Ricci flat metric exists. He can't prove that it exists, but uh, he, he knows that it will be unique. And uh, what Yao's theorem gives you is he proved the calabi conjecture, uh, and he proves that if you can check this topological condition, then there is, is definitively a Ricci flat Kähler metric, that is a calabi metric. Hence the name calabi -Yau. I want to emphasize that this is really a little bit of a miracle when you think about it. It says, check some topology, and then some differential geometry follows. Uh, that is a very uh, nice type of theorem because the topological theorems are relatively easy to check. And the central point here is that uh, Yao's theorem guarantees the existence of the metric, but it doesn't mean that we know what it is or can do anything with it. Of course, you can't do anything with it if you don't know what it is. And uh, Yao won the Fields Medal for this theorem. Um, in putting, putting the machine learning story in a uh, broader context here, so machine learning for Calabia metrics is what I want to talk about at a high level. And this is based on some variational ansatz for the metric. That is, the network produces a metric as a the network produces a metric as a function of some parameters. And the parameters are optimized to produce the, uh, the metric that you want with some desirable properties. For example, vanishing Ricci tensor. Um, so, so this is supervised, but not in the in, in the context of traditional supervised learning uh, where we have labeled data. A very good analogy to condensed matter physics, where instead of learning Calabia metrics, they learn quantum wave functions. Similarly there, they do not have labels in general, uh, at least for the variational Monte Carlo energy minimization version of the problem. Namely, in that case, the neural networks are representing wave functions rather than Calabia metrics. And the thing that they're trying to minimize is the energy. And so the idea is, is that if you minimize this energy, if you solve the variational problem on the theta is such that you minimize this energy, what you get is something close to the ground state, state wave function. That's the idea. So this sort of thing that I'm going to talk about here is elsewhere in the physics and machine learning literature, for instance, in the context of neural network quantum states. Let me tell you about machine learning for Calabi metrics. Like I said, I'll keep it high level. So uh, a famous Calabi equation is this. This is P. There are uh, Four, five complex variables here, z0 through z4, and then this product one. This psi is a complex parameter, and there's a hypersurface defined by this equation equals zero for every val complex value of psi. And uh, there is uh, particular interesting points in psi space that are interesting. And what that hypersurface gives you is a, is a hypersurface in P4 that's known as the mirror quintic. And, um, you know, this is this is a particular famous Calabi manifold, and one would like to be able to uh, to construct the metric on it. So, so how is this done in this recent paper by Fabian and collaborators and the other ones out there? First, one finds points on the Calabi L, then one optimizes the neural network, which produces the metric using three different types of losses: an overlap loss, a Kähler loss, and a Ricci flat loss. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about those. It repeats for different shapes and volumes, and this produces a calabi metric as a function of this complex parameter psi. Okay. So first, uh, what happens uh, to find points on the calabi Points are sampled from inside CP4. A complex line is taken through all pairs of points in that space, 
And that line is intersected with the Calabi-Yau equation, which gives five solutions, five sets of points lying on the Calabi-Yau itself. You can iterate this procedure many, many times to get many, many points lying on the Calabi-Yau. The neural network, and this is the one of the main things that I want to emphasize, is a very simple architecture that our friends were able to get good results with. Uh, what is the input of this mathematical problem? Ignore the neural network for a moment. First of all, you need points on the Calabi-Yau. There's five complex for coordinates, which is 10 real inputs, right? 10 real numbers. You need to know uh, when we have compact manifolds, we have different coverings of them associated with different patches that fit together in various ways. In this context, there's five different patches uh, on, on this Calabi-Yau manifold. Uh, you can cover it with five patches. And in particular, uh, so that means that we need to say what patch we're on, which is five choices. So there's the 10 choices, the 10 points associated, the, the, the 10 real numbers associated with the point on the Calabi-Yau, um, the 5D vector associated with which patch you're on, and then a point in complex structure space, this, this value psi, we want psi to be an input also, because we want to make the problem conditional on this psi that controls the shape of the Calabi-Yau. And so look, this is 10 plus 5 plus 2 real inputs, real bits of information that, I, that, that determine some of the structure of the problem. And that information, which is sort of just fundamental math, is going to be appearing as the input of the neural network. The output of the neural network is the independent components of the Hermitian metric. That's three real degrees of freedom on the diagonal and three complex off diagonal degrees of freedom for nine output nodes. So um, good. So, so this is a map. This, this information maps from R17 to R9. And so uh, uh, this simple feed forward network, I mentioned depth earlier. This is the width direction. This is the depth direction this way. And so this is a three layer neural network. Uh, so the depth is equal to three with input space R17 and output space R9. The inputs and the outputs are, as I said, so information related to the Calabi-Yau at input, the metric at output. Um, in this context, there are different types of things that the calabi metric has to satisfy. One is a certain overlap condition so that things fit together appropriately on the calabi uh, There's something else that uh, is associated with being a Kähler manifold called a Kähler form. This Kähler form is a differential two form J, technically a differential one one form, and it has to be, uh, it has to satisfy DJ and D bar J is equal to zero with respect to complex derivatives. So this is another uh, condition that has to be satisfied. And then there's a third constraint that comes from something called the Mange Ampere equation, which I won't get into too much. But the point is, is that any good Calabi metric has to satisfy all of these conditions. And therefore, you can think of this as three loss functions, L1, L2, and L3, that you throw together into some total loss with some weighting according to some parameters, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, which were found to take these values. OK, so, so thinking more broadly, this is an optimization problem. There's something you care about, whether in the condensed matter context, it's a neural network quantum state, or in this context, it's a calabi metric. You're trying to optimize it with respect to some loss. And these are losses that, uh, to, to have a perfect calabi metric, all of these things have to be 0. So you add them up, and then you minimize the total loss. Okay. Uh, there were some details of the training that I won't go into. I can, I can ask if need be. Uh, and, and these are various measures of the goodness. So there are the three losses, the blue dots, the orange checks, and the green crosses. And you can see one of them goes up a little bit. The other two go down during training. But uh, perhaps the better measure is that this sigma measure per epoch here, which is related to the Kähler form and the holomorphic tree form, this is a, this is a measure of, of goodness of the Calabi outfit. Uh, this goes down by uh, over gosh, it goes down by over an order of magnitude or so. I'm getting it wrong. It's about an order of magnitude uh, uh, during training. And this is just one type of result that they have. There are other ones that are out there, and Fabian can comment in glorious detail. But this is sort of the essence of this aspect of, of the metric learning problem, just that there are metrics in uh, there, there are metrics that we care about in mathematical physics, in this case, Calabi Yau's that have to have certain losses go to zero. And if you have a neural network that, uh, that represents the metric, you can just train directly on those losses using some samples for the points at input that, uh, to try to achieve the Calabi metric. And this has already, in follow-up work by Fabian and Anthony Ashmore, been driving into directions of physics results using the learned Calabi metrics to do things like test aspects of swampland distance conjectures. But um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll leave it there. 
maybe I will also do this part of the talk now as well, so that I can leave sort of five or 10 minutes for questions at the end so we can have some, some discussion. So, so part four is knots and natural language. Uh, what we're going to do is explicit unknotting and automating of topology. So the physics and math essentials in this context is that knots are a fundamental object in math. And they're also showing up in physics, for example, via, via Wilson loop operators and Chern Simons theory. Uh, and you can take these knots and you can cut them. So if you cut this knot along here, along this line, and you take this endpoint and you follow along, yeah, you can see that this braid is what you get out of cutting this knot, right? Where these endpoints are identified. Yeah. So you cut the knot to get a braid, but to reproduce the knot from the braid, you identify these endpoints. But concretely, notice that you can encode the information in this braid by this overcrossing, 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 call it sigma one, sigma one, sigma one. So that in particular, you can represent this knot just by the sequence of integers one, one, one. But this trefoil knot, the simplest non-trivial knot, can be represented by the information one, one, one in some encoding, right? Uh, there's various aspects of it. So part of the braid story is that braids form a group. There are inverses and compositions and associativity. Uh, more crucially for the talk today, uh, for this part of the talk, is that there are relations between them. So there are, there are things that you can do to the braid that are topologically equivalent. You can see, for instance, that you can uh, move this one up here and move this one back here to produce this. So this is saying that uh, if this is the generator sigma one, and this is the generator sigma three that does that overcrossing, this is the generator sigma two, then this braid is represented by sigma one, sigma three, sigma two in the group, alternatively just one, three, two as integers. This in, as, as a topological object is equivalent to three, one, two. So this says one, three, two is equal to three, one, two. And this is one of the braid relations that exists. So braid relations, the braids are represented by sequences of integers, but there are equivalences of them according to these braid relations. So for example, one, three, two is three, one, two, or in this context, in this picture, one, two, one is two, one, two. Okay. Uh, finally, as I already mentioned, you can turn the braids back into knots by identifying the endpoints. You can see how via closing off the braid in this way on this picture, it's the same braid if you just look at this little window, the knot, you form a knot by taking the closure. So the same knot can be represented as the closure of many different braids. And you can actually talk about equivalences of the knot that actually change the braid structure. So this is a different type of move, not the braid relations that I mentioned before, but this is a different type of move. For example, this simple stabilization move weaves in an extra strand. But if you imagine closing off this picture, boom, 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 I can close off this one down below. And this thing can be untwisted, right? If I close this down below, I can untwist it, and the little window would be the old braid that I had before. So this is a move that changes the braid structure in this little window, but, but preserves the topology of the knot closure. Punchline is there are different types of moves that preserve the structure of the knot associated with the braid. And you can think of that in the topological game associated with knots as different moves that you can make in a little video. Uh, a crucial thing to mention is that this sort of sequence data that we see arising naturally, that the knot can be represented as a braid and the braid can be represented as a sequence of integers. <clears throat> That's very similar to natural language processing, where we have a sequence of words rather than a sequence of integers. And this is something that machine learning is very good at. There's a lot to say here about very famous results, including Harry Potter, uh, but that's for another time. So, so I don't have too much to say about natural language processing today in this context. But um, what, I, what I would say is, is that I think in the future for the harder not problems that we're going to address in the future, using these fancy architectures is, uh, is gonna be an important part of the story. Uh, what is true is that a lot of times simple architectures, like even in the Calabi metrics problem, it was just simple feed forward networks. Simple architectures can actually make real progress on, on hard problems that we care about. So, so the upshot is, is when you apply ML to some problem for the first time, Try the simplest thing first. Don't try to become as fancy as possible. I think natural language processing will be crucial in the future for knots. But I'm going to tell you about two problems associated with knots. The first is unknotting. The problem is simple. You can cast it in the language of topological invariance, but that actually takes a long time to compute. <clears throat> the basic question is, given this knot, can you deform it without ripping or tearing until it's a circle, or can you not do that? So the trefoil knot is not the unknot. The unknot can be deformed into a circle, 
the, the trapoidal knot is not an unknot because it's topologically non-trivial. So this is one of the central problems in knot theory. And there is no known fast algorithm for computing this, uh, this question. You can see if you try a little bit that it gets a lot harder as the number of crossings of the knot goes up. So if you look at this image, for instance, it turns out that this, uh, and you can see it very quickly, can actually be untangled into a circle, right? You can see how you do it. On the other hand, this one cannot. Okay, but the number of crossings goes up. It turns out one of these can be untangled into a circle and the other one cannot. But you can't tell it in a fast way just from looking at it the way that you can with these two, right? And it's because the complexity of the problem goes up with the number of crossings. This is a sort of context where one might wanna use something like reinforcement learning, uh, which is a, yet a different type of machine learning. So an agent interacts in an environment, it perceives a state from state space, it has a policy that picks an action given the state. And the idea is, is that as this agent rolls out its policy, as it starts exploring its world according to its policy, it arrives in new states and receives a reward, which accumulate into successive rewards over the course of its lifetime, uh, potentially penalized by what's called a dis discount factor so that future rewards are worth less than, than next time step rewards. And this can be encoded in, in so-called value functions that tell you, the, for instance, the value of being in the state that you're in. And this can be used to update the policy function. The whole idea is that the agent over time accumulates rewards and uses the information that it collects to update its policy function so as to improve behavior in the future. Just like if any of you have kids or pets, uh, you hope that uh, via learning lessons from things that go well or don't go well, that they change their behavior over time. And you know, part of, part of being a human is optimizing that problem. So we uh, tackled this unknot problem with reinforcement learning. There's lots of details, but the key result is that uh, we, we tried two different things. On one hand, we said, suppose that we set up this knot game where we hand it some very complicated braid that is a representative of the unknot. And we ask, can you find the sequence of moves that turns this into the circle? Just like how here, you can see that there's a sequence of moves that you can do that turns this into a circle. And it is also true that there's a sequence of moves here that can turn this into a circle. That's the game that we want the AI to learn how to play. And um, the number of uh, crossings is the braid length. And uh, on one hand, you can say, I'm not going to do this reinforcement learning business at all. I'm just going to be a random walker. There's going to be some action space. I'm going to draw actions from a uniform distribution on action space and just go wherever that leads me. If you do that as a function of the braid length, you see that the percentage of the time that it successfully unknots the knot uh, goes down rapidly uh, with increasing braid length. On the other hand, uh, this, has, uh, this draws actions from a constant distribution at all times during training, each of these. But these other dots all use reinforcement learning, where over time, the distribution from which it draws actions, the policy function is updated so as to optimize rewards. And the best result is coming from something called trust region policy optimization, which you can see that the performance is relatively flat in the braid length. That <clears throat> even at, uh, for braids of length 96, uh, this is getting the, uh, finding the sequence that correctly untangles the unknot in, uh, in about 80% of the time, whereas the random walker is below 20%. So this sort of fall off is the sort of thing that is characteristic in, uh, 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 for random walkers. And one hopes that reinforcement learning can give rise to, to flat results like this to some degree of generality. Okay. Um, there's some things to say about interpretability, but I want to get to the last result and, and finish up. The last result is the following. It just says, okay, uh, what, can we address, instead of addressing the unknot problem, the fundamental topological problem, period. And then try to address the fundamental topological problem in the context of knot theory. So what do I mean by the general topological problem? What I mean is, can you learn topological equivalence? And I want to present a general schematic for doing this. Um, so for example, one might imagine that there, what, what topology is all about is that there's a, a, a notion of sameness or equivalence classes that you care about for some reason. Um, whether it be knots or Riemann surfaces or you know 
topological invariance of four manifolds, whatever it may be, there's some notion of sameness that takes different representatives of a given object and uh, puts it all in the same equivalence class, right? So K is one through N, these are different, uh, these, these are different equivalence classes. Uh, and the one through D are the different representatives of the same equivalence class. And the idea is, in general, if you wanted to automatically learn topological equivalence, solve the general topological problem, is that you would take different representatives of the equivalence classes, throw it into some problem relevant neural network architecture, where the output and the loss are trying to uh, increase the likelihood that equivalent things are labeled as equivalent according to the neural network. So in the first results we ever presented on this, we picked a distinguished member of the class. Uh, and we required that all reps reconstruct that member at output. And we looked for clustering in the latent layer before the output. But something that we did more recently uh, is uh, what's used use what's calling the triplet loss. So in the triplet loss, we uh, take an anchor, a positive, and a negative. That is, the anchor is the anchor of the problem. It's something that we pick. The positive is a representative that is in the same class as the anchor. The negative is a representative of, of, of the object that is in a different class than the anchor. And so what you want to try to do is to try to minimize the distance of the positive, update the neural network so that it minimizes the distance of the positive to the anchor while maximizing the distance of the negative to the anchor. That is, we want to cluster things in the same equivalence class together. Yeah. So in the context of this uh, not application, we want to learn topological equivalence. The input is a, is a doubled braid for the reason that I, um, the, the, reason, the reason it's a doubled braid is because there's periodic boundary conditions on the braid. And by doubling the braid, we ensure that the network sees all of the different representatives according to the periodic boundary conditions. Uh, and what we do is we take this B plus B, we throw it into a uh, convolutional 1D filter with stride one so that the convolutional filter proceeds down like this. Uh, we then pool and we have a dense layer to uh, a 300 dimensional latent space, uh, sorry, a 300 dimensional hidden space. And then we have a dense layer to some latent space uh, that is the output actually. And then we run a triplet loss on it. So all we're trying to do is take different representatives of the same braid class and cluster them together in some latent space via a learning, uh, a learning scheme. So uh, this is surprising that this worked so well to me. We tried a 2D latent space first. Uh, clearly, uh, this is good for visualization. If the clustering happens already in a two-dimensional latent space, it means that the visualization is easy. It might be naive to think that it would actually work, but it actually worked quite well in our cases. So in the upper left, what we have is the architecture that I just mentioned and the, the associated, um, yeah, the architecture that I just mentioned before any training whatsoever. And uh, in this case, uh, it happens to, to, to map it in this way into the latent space. There are 20 different test set classes associated with the knots. You can see that they're just scattered all over the place, right? And the idea is, is that we know, uh, the neural network doesn't know yet because it's at epic zero. We know that these different dots are in the same class. So this pink dot is to a topologically equivalent knot to this pink dot and is a topologically equivalent not to that pink dot, but they're spread all over the place. The topological problem is basically to say, how do we learn a way to put the like things together? That's what topological invariants do. And we can automate it with machine learning. So at 400 epochs, you can see that applying the triplet loss to, to an output like this, things are very tightly clustered together. It's not perfect, like these orange guys are down here on their own, and there's a little bit of spread. It's also a little hard to tell the colors apart sometimes. But generally, these things are very tightly clustered. And you can see that this is a big improvement compared to this other case. There's also a certain knot classification that is uh, uh, part of uh, the study of knot theory for low numbers of crossings. And uh, this works well there, too. So to conclude uh, this section and um, then uh, try to say it clearly here, and I, I left time for discussion because really that's what I wanted to do, um, is that in machine learning for Calabi metrics, the basic idea is to have an expressional variational ansatz for the metric, and then to use the fantastic modern neural network libraries that are out there, which allows you to build architectures easily and optimize them quickly. In that context, uh, there are various different properties that a Calabi metric has to have that a general element of the variational ansatz will not. And so there's some loss function that you can compute that you can try to minimize to push you in the Calabi direction. And that's exactly what, what um, 
what the three papers did uh, in various different ways. And so we see that this sigma measure, for instance, which needs to go to zero when uh, when uh, you hit the Calabi-Yau metric, this is decreasing across the 20 different epochs. Uh, and similarly, these other losses, the Mangin pair loss, the Kaler loss, and the overlap loss are all appearing here. Um, this type of machine learning pipeline is very similar to what people in condensed matter physics do for neural network quantum states, um, similar in spirit. And, and finally, in this part about knots and natural language, I tried to explain that knots are a fundamental subject in topology. And if we have a braid representation of the knot, the braid representation of the knot as data is just the sequence of integers. And because it's a sequence of integers and natural language is about sequences of things, of words, which you might label by integers, it's natural to try to use natural language processing techniques on knot theory. I didn't do that in the two problems we did today. It's in a different problem in our paper. Uh, we use more simpler networks in this context. In the two problems today, I did explicit unknotting and automating of topology associated with, uh, uh, with, with um, with this knot problem. And I showed that a reinforcement learning architecture has very flat performance uh, when it tries to unknot tangled knots. The random walker does quite poorly as the number of crossings is increased, but the reinforcement learning, uh, the, the trust region policy optimization at least is relatively flat. And finally, in automating topology, the goal was to try to cluster, try to learn a neural network that maps uh, representatives of some knot, braid representatives of some knot, into a latent space such that like things cluster and topologically distinct braids, uh, uh, topologically distinct knots don't cluster. And you can see that this clustering is going quite well on this in this context. Okay, so um, there's a lot to say about what one might do from here, but maybe I'll, I'll just stop there and uh, I left 10 minutes for questions. So are there questions? I see you, Peter. You look like you have a question. Well, in any case, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, it seems that you have uh, answered all questions, or Good. Uh, there are some people who uh, who still have some questions. It's okay if not. <laughs> Leaving time for discussion doesn't mean that it always happens. <laughs> well, if you don't allot the time, there are more discussions as we saw in the break. Yep. Uh, uh, so what's the story with Harry Potter? <laughs> there is this result. Have, you don't have serious questions we can. Yeah. The, the, um, the point is, this is an example of just how good these techniques have gotten. So this is a result from last summer called GPT-3. And what it does is it learns a lot about language and the human then provides the prompt. So in the bold is the prompt that is fed to the neural network. And then the rest of the text is generated by the neural network. So uh, you provide a prompt and the idea is, is that it then write text that sort of completes naturally what the prompt would give you. So the human wrote, below is a screenplay for a film noir hard-boiled detective story by Raymond Chandler about the boy wizard Harry Potter, Harry Potter by Raymond Chandler. And then the neural network com completed, Harry Potter, private eye, scene, a small dingy office, early morning, furniture of the Salvation Army store variety, sorted atmosphere. And it sort of continues on. And the point is, is that um, this is uh, about generative models for texts. So instead of trying to do classification problems, it's, it's about trying to uh, have neural networks that can actually do writing for you uh, or generation of some other sequence data for you, right? So um, in math and physics context where we want to generate sequence data, one could imagine doing something like this, but of course they apply it to broadly understandable natural language problems. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you read this, 
it's pretty impressive that the AI generates complete sentences like this, I think. So a young man in a double-breasted gray suit is leaning against the building. Harry sighs and goes out the door. He walks up to the young man and without ceremony punches him in the jaw. You know, it's, it, it, it took the information that it needs to be about Harry Potter and it needs to be a screenplay and it needs to be a, about, a, about a detective and it completed text that fit all those categories. And so this was, I think it's safe to say that a lot of people would say this is the most impressive AI result from last year. And uh, these sorts of techniques, are that because it's about natural language, is the sorts of things that I think we'll need for not theory in the long run. So, so the, 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 this learned this learn the books of Raymond Chandler, and then in a certain way, it puts it in in this perspective. Or that's right. That's right. Um, that's right. It must in some way know how Raymond Chandler writes his writes the stories. Yeah. Yeah. So it trains yeah. on an enormous amount of information, and so they're putting various books and online articles and whatnot through the trained. So they're training on an enormous amount of natural language that people have produced, and then you can give it something like this. And it, indeed, it learns what a, it learns what a detective story is like. It learns how Raymond Chandler writes, etc. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, is, is is this more complicated than this uh, picture recognition? Uh, or yeah, this is much more complicated. So this is. Um, this was a big paper out of OpenAI from last year, and I'm not sure how much the training costs were, but they were very, very large. And um, the, the simple picture recognition types of things can be trained on a laptop for free. Uh, so, um, yeah. So this is this is this is state of the art as of 2020. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there more questions? Well, I guess it does not seem to be the case. So we thank you again very much. Thank you very much. So uh, you can have, you have done your work for today. So you can do that. I, have, I can go have that beer now, right? No, it's yeah. 11 a.m. here. I can't do that. <laughs>